Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Charles R. Bronfman, co-founder of Birthright Israel, to introduce our closing speaker. Thank you so much. And before I start, I'd just like to congratulate <coughs> Abby, Angelica, and those who had to do with making this such a wonderful conference for all. This is the last introduction of the last speaker. It ain't the last supper, though. So anyway, it's always seemed to me that an enduring society must have heroines, heroes, and yes, myths. Rebecca Heller is no myth. She's a heroine. She's the co-founder and director of the International Refugee Assistance Project. IRAP, as it's known, works to create enforceable legal and human rights on behalf of some of the world's most vulnerable populations. Her interest in the legal challenges facing refugees began in 2008 when she was fulfilling a scholarship <coughs> from Yale University Law School. At that time, she traveled to Amman to learn about the situation facing Iraqi refugees. And while there, Becca met with people suffering from persecution, discrimination, and intense poverty. They sought international protection and resettlement in order to save their lives. Yet none understood how to navigate the legal processes involved and no legal aid was available. She was outraged. She had many, many emotions but outrage, I think, Becca was the most important one. And when she returned to Yale, she and four peers created IRAP to mobilize law students to meet the need. In partnership with pro bono lawyers from some of the nation's leading law firms and multinational corporations, IRAP has achieved policy victories in the US Congress and international bodies that are affording rights protection to over 120,000 displaced persons worldwide. A global leader for legal issues in refugee settlement, IRAP has won broad systematic reforms of US and international laws and protocols that include enactment of five separate pieces of US congressional legislation. Very few weeks ago, when President Trump announced the initial U.S. ban on refugees from seven countries, IRAP mobilized an emergency task force of more than 1,600 lawyers and law students who defended the legal and human rights of those refugees and immigrants who were banned from entering the United States. You may recall the masses of people at airports that were protesting uh, and serving all these folks, they were organized by Becca and by IRAP. Mazel tov. And that work and other work under the radar <coughs> led to, <coughs> pardon me, uh, that led to an emergency temporary restraining order, which we all know about, preventing their detention and deportation as a result of that order. And I believe, Becca, you've done the same for the second. Thank you. <laughs> You're waiting for the third, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I just think of all that, and I'm sure as I'm giving this little introduction, you're all thinking of it. What would have happened if when we left our, our shtetls and our grandparents and parents and great-grandparents left our shtetl, their shtetls, that they would have been denied entry to this great country. Just think, what a shocking and horrible thing. To date, over 3,200 students from 29 IRAB law school chapters have worked with attorneys for more than 75 top tier global firms and eight multinational corporations to provide legal assistance to more than 3,100 refugees with an 85% success rate. More importantly, IRF's model is sustainable, it's flexible, <coughs> and has the ability to expand 
in order to accommodate a growing caseload and new partners. Now, in addition to being director of IRAP, Becca's had a couple of awards got, uh, to, given to her. She's a visiting clinical lecturer at Yale Law School. She has received awards and recognition of her work with IRAP, including a Skadden Fe Fellowship, an Echo and Green Fellowship, a Gruber Human Rights Fellowship, a Cordes Fellowship, a Truman National Security Fellowship. What the hell are you doing with all those fellowships anyway? And a Dartmouth College Martin Luther King Jr. Emerging Leader in Social Justice Award. She was also named one of the Christian Science Monitor's 30 Under 30 Changemakers and is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. In addition to all this, she became the 12th Charles Bronfman Prize Laureate and in conversation last spring with Tina Brown at the induction ceremony, she said, this wave of refugees isn't that different from people going from port to port during World War II. I think what's different is for calling them terrorists. She went on to say that refugees are survivors, and that's exactly who we want coming here. At that same ceremony, Madam Justice Rosalie Silberman Abella of the Supreme Court of Canada, in speaking for the judges of our prize, said, and I quote, what magnetized us was the alchemy of compassion, fearlessness, resoluteness, and collaboration, entrepreneurship, brilliance, and feistiness that led to one of the most innovative and effective pro bono models the legal, the legal profession has seen. It's my honor to introduce a woman who is my heroine and shortly will be yours, Becca Heller. Uh -huh. And by the way, she's funny as hell. <laughs> uh, I ran into Charles this morning and I said, when you introduce me, how much of what you say is going to be true and how much are you going to make up? And he said, I have to make up all of it, otherwise they won't let you speak. Um, so thank you, Charles, for that, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to JFN for having me. Um, when you're told that you have 10 minutes to close out a conference people have been at for two days full of really good content and your main goal is to be inspiring, it creates a lot of pressure. Um, I was emailing with a friend of mine last night trying to figure out how I wanted to kind of package the 87,000 things I wanted to say and he sent me this New York Times article that he thought might be helpful. And the headline was, Infiltration, Peril in Refugee Scene. And the lead read, federal officials here, that being New York, and in Washington declared yesterday that all government departments would continue to guard against the admission to this country of spurious refugees or refugee groups that might act as a cover for the infiltration of enemy agents. And the date of that article was June 3rd, 1942. History only repeats itself if we let it. When Daniel did the Var Torah, he said, we don't do endings as Jews, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, as soon as it ends, we go back to the beginning. Um, so I'll start a little bit with my beginning in this issue. I was between my first and second summers at Yale Law School, and I was doing an internship in Israel. Um, and the long story short is that I didn't have very much to do. Uh, I was sitting in this air-conditioned office in Tel Aviv, and I was watching Mad Men. And at the time, there had only been two seasons of Mad Men, so I really quickly ran out of episodes. Um, and then I had nothing to do, and I was just sitting there, and I kept hearing about all of these Iraqi refugees in Jordan, and I got this sort of crazy idea that I was going to go meet some. Um, it wasn't my goal to lawyer for them. I, in fact, was not a lawyer at the time, um, or to start an organization. I just felt that as a U.S. citizen, I had some responsibility to understand the fallout of my own country's foreign policy, and I thought maybe if I was feeling really ambitious, um, I would go home and write an opinion editorial for, you know, the New Haven Register or some other bastion of investigative journalism. So I emailed everyone I could think of, and I went to Jordan, and I was able to meet with six refugee families. And I was expecting a lot of humanitarian fallout. You know, people couldn't get access to health care. People had medical emergencies. Children couldn't go to school. Um, for a lot of people, like women trying to escape honor killings, their persecutors were following them into Jordan, and they weren't safe. 
but every single person independently identified their primary need as essentially legal. Um, they, um, this is a little next gen, but I don't know if you guys know the song Closing Time by The Verve, um, if you grew up in the 90s, uh, but it has this line that says, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Um, and I think that that really sums up the situation for most refugees, and, and particularly in this day. So um, I was trying to think of what I could do to help, and everyone seemed to think that they were on a waiting list, and that if they could just hang in there long enough and make it through another day, eventually someone from the US or the UN or what's it called, Canada, um, would call them and say, you know, your, your number is up, um, you can get on a plane and you can go to safety. So the week ended and I finagled a meeting uh, with the US Embassy um, and I said, you know, I'm a Yale Law student, I'm really interested in this refugee program you have going on, can you tell me about it? And they started talking about it and I realized um, both how arduous it is to navigate. To come to this country as a refugee, you have to have a minimum of seven interviews. Um, they can be anywhere from one to six hours long. You submit hundreds of pages of documents. You get security checked by 18 different agencies, like nine of which we don't know exist. Um, and then at the end of all that, someone makes a decision upon which you literally live or die. Um, and yet no one has said, perhaps if you're going through this legal process and your life is on the line, you ought to have a lawyer. Um, and I felt like at the very least, I could find out, you know, how long is the waiting list? Because I could go back to the families I talked to and say, I know this is hard. If you can just stick it out for six more months, you can get on a plane. So I, I ended the session by saying, you know, can you tell me how long the waiting list is? Like, when can they expect a call? And the response was, what waiting list? And apart from being a metaphor that is a useful rhetorical device in a speech like this, I, I don't think that the waiting list is a nefariously propagated rumor by the US government and the UN to placate people. I think if you live in the bottom of a deep dark hole, you have to believe that there's some kind of light at the top. And the fact that the best light at the top of the hole that these communities could come up with was, to me, the embodiment of bureaucracy was a waiting list, was so tragic um, that, that something had to be done to empower them to better navigate their own circumstances. And, and Charles alluded to this, but what I really love about working with refugees is that they are survivors. They are people who have been through things that, that most of us can't even imagine, who have gotten out and who are desperate to start better lives, but have these sort of mostly bureaucratic and now unfortunately increasingly political um, problems in their way. So I organized a group of students at Yale and we started working on the cases. Our supervising professor called us in one day and he said, you guys aren't working on cases, are you? And we were pretty stupid, but not super stupid. So we sort of were like, oh, that's an interesting question, Mike. Like, why do you ask? And he said, because that's illegal. We call that the unauthorized practice of law and you're not lawyers. And we said, well, where are we gonna find some lawyers? And then we thought, law firms come here and recruit all the time. Why don't we just call up the law firms and say, hey, do you wanna sink your claws into some Yale Law students? Take on some of these cases and you can work one-on-one -on -one with students. And that's really how the model was born. Um, so today we have chapters at 29 law schools. We've provided direct representation to resettle over 3,200 people. We have a legal advice hotline that's provided legal advice to more than 19,000 people. Um, and up until November, our role was really to try to, almost from a design perspective, I think, look at the way that the world processed refugees and say, as nerdy lawyers who read all of the fine print of these processes and have walked through this 19,000 times, where are the places that can be sort of changed or leveraged to make a big difference for thousands of people? And I think a lot of things changed in November. We, we would describe ourselves not as bipartisan, but as apartisan. I do not think that refugees ought to be a political issue. I think it is really tragic the way that refugees have been politicized, both in the US and in Europe. Um, but we saw that the very existence of programs to aid refugees was really under threat, um, following some of the leadership changes that have occurred. And we were pretty depressed, but from a sort of weird, you know, selfish existential standpoint, I thought, well, there's never been a better time to lead an army of 3,000 lawyers trying to defend the rights of refugees. And we started planning. Um, and we said, what could be coming down the line and how can we resist that and how can we protect refugee rights in the face of that? And when it came, we were ready. Um, you know, President Trump was sworn in on January 20th. That was a Friday. The following Monday, versions of what exec eventually became the travel ban started to leak. 
Um, we had told all of our clients, get on a plane, get to the US, no one knows what's coming or when it's coming, we'll have a lawyer meet you at the airport to make sure you can get in. Um, every day that week we had clients who were landing. Meanwhile, we realized that it wouldn't be just our clients who are coming into the country. Refugees actually travel in groups by law. Um, any plane carrying one refugee would probably come in carrying about 50 or 60 just because of the way that refugees are resettled. So we put out a call. Um, it was like the middle of the night between the Wednesday and Thursday of that week, which was the 25th and 26th. And I emailed like two listservs and I said, you know, we're looking for a couple of people who can be at the various major international airports. Um, if you're available, please fill out this Google form. And in 90 minutes, 1,600 people had signed up and our Google form had crashed, which I suppose is another design challenge that we should take up with Google. Um, so we converted it into a survey and then we waited. And on Friday, we had a client land at JFK. He landed at 4.30 in the afternoon, right when the executive order was signed, because we realized that there were gonna be people who literally lost their status in the sky, right? When you got on a plane in Colombia or Israel or Jordan or the Congo, you, were, you had valid entry to the US, and sometime over the Pacific or Atlantic Ocean, something was gonna be signed that meant when you landed, you had no right to enter. And, and we didn't think there was a plan for what would happen to those people, and in fact, there wasn't. They were all detained at airports and holding cells without food, without beds, without water. Um, but thankfully, with about 11,000 lawyers uh, who largely spontaneously showed up to file petitions on their behalf. And 27 hours after the first executive order was signed, um, we got an order on behalf of our client. His name is Hamid Darwish. He was a refugee because he worked for 10 years for the US military in Iraq. Um, two of his coworkers had been killed. He had been shot at and undergone numerous death threats. He had traveled to the US with his three children. And when they landed, they let his wife and his three children out and then they locked him up in a cell for 36 hours. And when we filed a petition to get him freed, we said, what the hell? Let's try to make this a national class action and see what happens. And that was granted. Um, so at 9.30 p.m., 27 hours after the executive order was issued, a court ruled that no one could be detained or returned to their country of origin pursuant to the executive order. What I didn't know... <laughs> the second time around, it didn't take us 27 hours because we had it pre-written. Uh, I, I was inside JFK at this time, and what I didn't know is that while we were trying to get all these lawyers to these airports, citizens were gathering outside in protest at airports around the country and they were chanting, let them in, let them in. And, and help came pouring in. Um, philanthropists who were sort of willing to be creative and take a risk and jump into the fray um, sent funds to us, to the ACLU, to the National Immigration Law Center, to tons of places that enabled us to build out a rapid response mechanism. Um, Tons of lawyers wanted to get involved. We, we've now created a pro bono coordinator position to figure out, okay, there's 100,000 lawyers who want to do something about this. Like, how can we use that collective action to make some creative plays to protect immigrants and refugees? And um, I, fa I think, you know, lawyers get a little bit of a bad rap. Um, and when I used to say that, like, no, what refugees need even more than food is a lawyer, people thought I was totally bonkers. Um, and so I think the the most validating article for me was a piece that ran in Slate, and the headline simply said, the lawyers came and they won. And I think about some of my own recent ancestors whose names are lost because they couldn't get out of Europe in time. And I wonder if we had been able to mobilize this way if civil society, if lawyers and doctors and funders and voters and young people had come together in 1942 or in 1939, and if at every port the St. Louis tried to land at, there were thousands of Americans there chanting, let them in, if history might have been different. History only repeats itself if we let it, unlike speeches in which repetition can be a useful rhetorical device. A lot of people are talking about, quote, the biggest refugee crisis since World War II, or the 60 or 65 million refugees around the world. And faced with this staggering number and this massive crisis, we have two choices. We can decide this is too big, or too complicated, or too scary, or too far away, and we can turn our backs. Or we can hear the number 60 million refugees and realize that each of those people has a name and a mother 
and a desperate dream for a light at the end of a very long journey. And we can stand up and open our hearts and say, let them in. Thank you.